This week on the Deep Leadership Podcast. I think that we're in a unique time in history, but we're not in quite of a spectacularly different, you know, extinction level uh, sort of situation as people might might think. And that uh, just focus on your unique value, focus on your family, focus on your community. And uh, I think there's a lot more evidence that we're we're heading to a, a better place rather than a, a less good place on the technology front. This episode is brought to you by the Salty Sailor Coffee Company, the official coffee of the Deep Leadership Podcast. Salty Sailor is a veteran-owned coffee brand on a mission to deliver premium, fresh roasted coffee while making a positive impact in the world. Their motto is drink coffee and do good, which reflects their commitment to making amazing coffee and actively supporting the military community. 10% of every order goes to the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, an organization dedicated to helping sailors, Marines, and their families in times of need. All our listeners get 10% off every order of their amazing coffee by using the discount code DEEP at checkout. So check them out at SaltySailorCoffee.com. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today I'm joined by Garrick Tate. Garrick is an AI futurist, investor, and strategy consultant. His expertise lies at the intersection of AI, IQ, and EQ. He helps businesses Increase their value using AI. With over a decade of experience as a successful entrepreneur, Garrick has founded companies spanning software development, outsourcing, and publishing. Garrick is a sought-after speaker on AI's future and its practical applications in business. Now, I'm excited to have him on the show to talk about how companies and leaders need to be thinking about AI and how to deploy AI going forward. So, Garrick, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I am excited too. I don't think we've dedicated a whole show to AI and the impact it possibly could have on our businesses. So I'm really excited to have an expert on the show to talk about it because I think it's already affecting all areas of our lives now. We're seeing it everywhere we go. Uh, I think something I saw the other day on a video was uh, AI taking orders in a drive through fast food restaurant, you know, and it's like, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, so yeah, so I think AI is here. It's changing business, and and you're here to help us understand it. So, first of all, let's talk about the future. So, where where are some of the challenges, and what are some of the challenges and threats that AI poses to society overall? You know, I think that the you know the biggest worry is definitely the unknowns. Uh, you know, most of the known challenges. You know, we have incredibly smart people. Uh, you know, a lot of society is is having their eyeballs on this, you know, we're not, we're not starved for a lack of attention. Sometimes we're, we're starved for a lack of the right incentives, but we're certainly not starved for, for attention on these problems and incredibly smart, um, dedicated people are working on them. So the, the biggest problems are definitely the, the unknown problems. Uh, with that being said, you know, the, the one that I think a lot of people will be feeling and, and are feeling is that the marginal cost of content has ultimately gone down to basically zero now so that has the split of both our attention becoming more easily frazzleable where the stimulation has just you know been increasing ever more but i'm not so worried about that because ultimately society adapts to that in the sense of you only have so many hours in a day. You're essentially the algorithms, the news feeds, and your spam filters, and all that stuff will begin to adapt to hopefully just give you more and more of the cream of the crop. You know, people are are now rewarded for really providing exceptional value because there's so much noise. So I, I think that in some ways that has a net positive. But what does worry me is a little more of the the scam artists and the people who can. Yeah. create you know scam and, and bad actors can now do that more easily at scale um so those are are some of the the worries that i i think about and um really excited to see as you know kind of a seesaw back and forth you know arms race on, on those kinds of things you know what's interesting is like today you can almost tell ai you can almost see it you know you can feel it it's a little bit awkward right and um, it's just like 
like I, you know, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, right? It's like the video games from my generation, they were crappy, right? You know, and they were stupid. And, uh, and now you see the video games today and you're like, holy cow, like, you know, so it's like, you know, a million X times what I, you know, space invaders, right? And so yeah. I think today we sort of feel a little bit comfortable, like, well, we can sort of see AI, you know, like we can see something that seems a little bit off. It's not quite hundred percent right yet, but soon it will be. <laughs> and you won't be able to distinguish between like a human and, and an AI generated, you know, either text or video or a photo, right? I mean, is that, that's probably coming very shortly. Yeah, I would argue that in a lot of ways it's, it's already here. I mean, the, the AI was trained off the internet and uh, what no one I think quite suspected is that the internet is like 90% SEO trash. And so there's a lot of SEO articles that were, you know, had to write it 500, 500 words and take this 200 you know, word subject and kind of expand it out. And so a lot of uh, what we get from AI is what you would expect from a SEO freelance writer or from mm -hmm. a student who uh, had to write that 10 page paper by tomorrow. And so uh, that's what we're getting a lot of. And right now what um, OpenAI and other platforms are doing is they are not just trying to get more data at this point. Uh, they're trying to refine the data and get better data. Uh, actually, I know that, that right now something's being tested that's a little bit scary is they're actually trying to have some AIs only trained on good data, produce lots of it, and then have the bigger platform then consume that. Uh, it's a little bit questionable if that actually makes you know makes sense, but there's a there's a definitely a, a shift going on right now to be consuming better data because right now yeah AI writes like a like an SEO copywriter and that's not yeah. great. Yeah. And, and so, you know, like I said, today, I think it seems as if we can sort of sense what it is and what, it, you know, where it is. But like I said, going forward, it's it's going to be a lot more difficult. Do you see that there are certain jobs that just sort of go away with with AI's maturity? You know, and I think of I think of like creators, you know, like, like I'm a writer. I've written three books like now you can tell, you know, chat GPT to write you a book and, you know, you know and, and, and in the future, it's going to be even better, I would imagine. So, I mean, is so, that, so guys like me, like we're out, writers, we're out of business. I mean, what's, what, what's going to happen to people who are content creators? So I, I'm not worried about that at all. Uh, and, and there's a couple of insights that uh, I have and, and, and some that I've been exposed to that, that uh, make me think that's not the biggest worry. There's certainly, though, some industries are going to be impacted differently than others. And so I think it is really important to be, to be aware of this. So to to lay out a, a, a few different points on this. One is that AI isn't taking over a job, but it will be taking over tasks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. It will be taking over tasks. Yep. So every job is is a stack of tasks. You know, it's pretty easy to imagine this. And ultimately we want the AI to be taking over those tasks that you know ideally we don't want to be doing that are are grinding, etc. Um and then what well, that really means is that every job, it's not so much that jobs will go away and then new jobs will be created. It's that all of our jobs are going to begin to be transformed as certain tasks take over. There's actually um, a fantastic example of this before AI. When ATMs were widely adopted by, by banks, they did 80% of what bank tellers did. And so the obvious answer, the obvious panic at that point from bank tellers is, well, that's, you know, four fifths of us just gone because, you know, now one person can do the, the work of five. But after ATMs were widely adopted, and we, we, can, we can point to the, the, the decade, that, that decade didn't have any drop. In fact, the number of bank tellers actually went up because now banks could open up more, uh, more locations. And so, what we found is that in that case, the supply demand curve, it was being constrained by the supply side, not by the demand side. Mm -hmm. And I, when I'm looking around, a lot of the jobs are worried about are not constrained by demand. They're constrained by, by supply. I would love to have 10 times more developers than I have right now in my software company. Uh, that's something we, we specialize in actually recruiting developers because it's just such a hard challenge. 
And so I that that's the second insight. Um, the third insight I would the third insight I would say out on this. Actually, I think I kind of embedded at embedded the third idea. I was going to go into um uh, how some of the tasks change, but I think I kind of embedded that already. So those those are the two points I would say. Um, yeah. And just to close out with with one more thought here, a lot of people are are worried about AI, you know, taking their jobs or 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 what have you. Their their worry isn't isn't on should I don't think it should be on the AI because AI doesn't have a goal. It's it's not trying to do anything. Instead, really, the conversation, I think, as it comes more and more of a matured place, is how are we structuring society? How are we how are we structuring companies and incentives to be taking care of people first and foremost, not um, just maximizing productivity in these smaller, smaller dimensions? And I think that that does mean that you know, people have should be supported as a upskill, as they you know can take on um, reskilling and and retooling, and I think that's that needs to be uh, the focus. I and mean, the AI is not going to take your job, but maybe one person who's maximized with AI can order the work ten people. Like I think the call center agency, that's going to be a big, a big, um, a big force. And so I think. Not seeing AI as the enemy, but just as a, a new technological revolution, something that we, we need to harness like we've done with every other technological revolution. You know, that's really the, the mature conversation we need to be having. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, you know, uh, the inter- you, ATM is a great example. The internet is a great another example. You know, the internet, oh, when that comes out there, well, we're not, you know, we're not going to need libraries anymore. We're not going to, you know, uh, you know, we're not going to need this and that and the other thing. Well, the thing is, what it has is it just enhanced what we can do right on a daily basis like i have a i have i have the world's knowledge in my pocket every day everywhere i go right i mean that's mm-hmm. this to me has enhanced my ability to do things in life so i think i think if we think of it, this technology is to enhance the things that we're already doing i think that's a better probably a better way to think about it so what are some of the opportunities that ai provides in your opinion so ai at this point, I think the, the cleanest metaphor is that it's the workhorse for knowledge work. So, you know, when you have uh, with, with modern day engines, we, we measure it in horsepower. <laughs> What's the equivalent number of horses that this engine can do? And I think there's something similar here of, you know, just like an engine, it can only, you know, a, a horse is maybe a little more adaptable. You can put in more situations, more flexible, you know, physically. But if you if you put that engine into the place, slot it into the place it's supposed to be. The amount of power and amount of revolutions it can do per per minute is is immense. Um, with the AI, if you prompt it correctly, I'm not talking about just using it as as a brainstorming assistant, even though that is absolutely, I think one of the, one of the top use cases for it as as a personal assistant. One of the things I'm most excited about. But the way that I consult with businesses and 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 team leaders. Is a little more on the automation side that when you can slot AI with the right prompts, with the right automations in the in the specific, very key part of your business, you can automate things that before were were not automatable. And then you can free up immense number of hours for your team to be doing their their actual creative and um, fulfilling work. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I know, for example, you know, uh I uh I, I, you know, I write, I write books and one of my books is in Spanish and I didn't do the audio book for it because I don't speak Spanish. So, so I just, just, so I just sell the book. I don't sell the audio book. And then now uh, Amazon now came out and said, Hey, you know, we've got this tool that will read your book in Spanish. And do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah. And that now I have a Spanish version of my audio book for my, for my first book. And again, that's an example of like, uh, you know, something you know, again, it's it's some it's it's a new thing that we never had before, right? That you can push a button now. You have a a a, a Spanish version of your uh, of your book. I talked to a guest uh, last night, and they are doing. He's taking all of his uh, all of his videos, all his training videos for leadership, 
and they're putting into 52 languages. They've created an AI twin of him and it reads uh, or presents uh, all this all this leadership material in in 52 different languages. So now they can take that same training program and deploy it, deploy it into a global company into the local languages. And and to me, I'm like, I'm OK, that's really cool. I mean, there's, these are things that are like we couldn't do before, like we could, but it would be a hell of a lot of work to do that. Right. To take, you know, one presentation and do it in 52 languages. You're talking about, you know a lot of work, a lot of effort, but this is being done now with these AI twins. And, and I can see some really powerful things that you can do with that w with respect to global companies for sure. Um, how should business owners? So I, you know, I mentioned when we started, you know, before we press record, I run a business, I have a manufacturing business, been running it for eight years. Uh, I've been thinking about AI, but, uh, and, and we have a lot of different business owners who listen in on the show, but how should business owners be and leaders in general be thinking about AI? How should they sort of think about this new technology? The way I walk people through how they should be adding AI is to, first of all, you know, know what it's good at, know know what's possible. You know, play around with ChatGPT, play around with with um, Midjourney and other tools out there. But then to take a, a step back from your business and you know, forget AI for a moment. Just look at where are the biggest bottlenecks in your business. And that is easier to say for a more established business after some product market fit has has been made. Because, you know, before that point, your bottleneck is, I don't know, there's like a, you know, a thousand things going on. So in the startup phases, it'll be a, a different framework. But if your business is dialed in and is perhaps a not not a well-oiled machine, but is chugging along like a machine. There are steps in your business process, steps in your in your customer journey. You run a manufacturing business, so I'm sure you you uh, think about this uh, a lot more purely than than most business owners, or this is probably a lot more familiar to you. But you know, seeing your your business a series of interlocking steps. I'm sure you've read the the goal by by Eli Goldratt. Of course. Yeah, we all have to. It's mandatory. If you've, if you've been in manufacturing, it's a mandatory reading for sure. Yeah. And so I, I think that book applies to, so for, for your listeners outside of manufacturing, I think that book applies to to all businesses. The The, the idea is to you know, find that one point in the process um, that is the bottleneck and then optimize for that point. So you might if you improve the wrong part of your of your process, let's say that your uh, convert your fulfillment is very very difficult, and you focus on increasing sales, you probably made your business more problematic, not not better. Um, yes, yeah, because you've optimized the wrong part, and so you want to take a step back, look at your metrics, look at your KPIs, find the run one part of your business that is um, struggling, and I define struggling as either a it's a it's a bottleneck to growth, it's painful just nobody likes doing it it's just basically you could say it's increasing employee churn because people don't like doing it um if you want to add a kpi to that uh third is just you know qa problems are are coming in it's just messy work and if if those pains apply to that that pain point then you can say okay how can we add in ai into this and that process is then all about looking at inputs and outputs. You know, AI by its very nature is a bit of a black box. There are some really exciting developments just recently this month in, in the month of, of May 2024 um, around being able to open that black box. But, but for the foreseeable future, it's very much still a black box. But if you can define its inputs and outputs, there's really nothing... I would argue that it can't do everything that we're finding that it's struggling with is areas where the inputs and outputs for humans are very clear, but for the AI, it's, it's not so clear. So if you can define that, then I think AI can be added into any business process and then hopefully blow out that bottleneck in that part of your business. So that's, that's the framework that I walk my clients through. That makes a lot of sense. You know, when I think about, bottlenecks, you know, we, I mean, bottlenecks in production, right? But one of the things I think of as a small business is one of the bottlenecks is me, like, like my technical expertise. That's how I have a company that produces a, a highly technical product, right? 
So I kind of be, I'm the guy that answers all the questions. You know, I'm, I have that, uh, you know, 30 plus years of knowledge in my head of, of technology and how it works. And that's a limiting factor in my company because I don't have many more of me, you know, and I would love to be able to, you know, take what's in this head and put it in some sort of an AI twin that could help me, you know, talk to customers technically about our products, you know, and answer like those technical questions, which, which all have answers. There's, it, uh, there's a logical flow to answering every one of these questions. It's just right now, it's just, it's me and my memory and me and my experiences. Right. And to me, like one way that would, that could really help my business is that pe not everyone has to go to the technical expert to, to solve a problem, right. That there's a tool, like you said, inputs and outputs, but the, the intelligence of, you know, how to, how to apply our products, how to use our products, which is the best product. It, it, that intelligence is built into the black box that could come up with, you put an input in, I've got this application and it puts out, well, then you need this product, right? That would, to me, would be like a game changer. Like it would make my life so much better, you know? It's, so it's not so much about even production. It's, it's that knowledge thing that you mentioned, which is knowledge workers and, and that knowledge content. I love that. Let, let, let's actually take that and just kind of expand on that as an example. So you know, you, you are the bottleneck, and in some ways, that's a, a hard bottleneck to solve because the inputs and outputs are so messy. That's that's your day-to-day -day life. You're, the inputs yeah. are everything you are seeing, everything that you're, you're yeah. experiencing, and the outputs is everything that you say and all the problems that you solve. So in some ways, it's, it's, it's very much like AI is never going to replace you, but it can replace specific tasks. Yeah. And so – you know, the applying applying the the framework to this, it would be, you know, what are the tasks that are you know, most painful that have the most number of QA or are, are the biggest bottlenecks to growth? And it kind of sounds like it's answering questions or, or or things of that nature. You're dealing with, you know, customer questions, employee questions, things, things there. And so at that at that point, probably the inputs are still pretty messy. The inputs have been massively reduced because it's no longer like uh, everything you do in the business. It's specifically answering questions as, as a technical expert. And so if that was the, the, the problem that I was solving, you know, how do we add AI into this? It would be, honestly, most of the work would be standardizing how those questions are asked. Basically, instead yeah. of saying, no, you don't accept emails, you don't accept chats, you only accept it through this form. Now maybe that's a terrible, um, a terrible medium. Maybe it should be, you know, Slack messages instead or whatever. But it would be standardizing to one place, and then we'd be asking ourselves, okay, if it's now in that standardized format, is that going to be, is that going to capture seventy percent of the messy, painful, or bottlenecked questions? Yeah. yeah. And if if so, we're probably in a good place. If it's like, no, no, you know, the 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 client that that takes up most of my time would never accept that. You know, he's always just going to email me or call me up on the phone, and that 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 will never work. Like, okay, well, let's let's look at this differently. But let's assume that that would work. Then the question will be, okay, we've now standardized the inputs. They're going to always put it in the same spot. They're going to expect the output, you know, in that same spot. Now, can we add the AI black box in this? And that's an open question. You know, maybe we can, maybe we can't. But at this point, you can create your own AI knowledge base so you can create your like it's kind of like custom gpts right you can make your own custom gpt add in a knowledge base that could be a document that you write like your entire product lineup it could also just be manuals um literally just textbooks on electrical engineering or, or other you know, engineering add all that into the ai and then the ai will first before it checks its global knowledge for an answer, it will always check the knowledge base first or try to factor the, the data from the knowledge base into the answer. And then that that AI can then start answering questions, hopefully in a way that, that would um, be at a high quality. And so, of course, in the very beginning, you would first walk through the AI. And, and this is something you can all do um, all do yourself with just custom GPTs and, and things on the market. Like this isn't like a, a, a thing you have to build from scratch or work with, with a company like mine to build. Um, but then the next step, and so I'm hoping your listeners are finding this valuable because it's, it's showing a, a real a real use case. Initially, you would then just measure, okay, I'm not going to have the chatbot obviously respond without me first seeing it. I don't trust it that much. So for the first three months, 
the, the only question is, is this going to save me time because I will spend less time editing its, its messages rather than writing them totally from scratch? And so that would be the, the measurement. And hopefully then you know, we've taken the most painful, takes the most amount of your time uh, um, thing and, and hopefully reduce those number of hours there. So that would be kind of the framework that would apply to that, that kind of a, what, what you said. Yeah, it makes sense. And again, it goes back to what you originally said. It's not going to be eliminating jobs. What it's going to be doing is taking some of the labor intensive, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of grunt work maybe and automating it to the point where, okay, well, I've got something smart here that can answer certain questions, you know, so I, you know, 80% of my, you know, the questions I answer can be automated and, and I've got that sort of set up now. And then I can kind of focus on the 20% that are difficult. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. So it's not like AI is going to replace me, uh, but it's going to maybe help me to be able to do more. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that's, a lot of that's sense. That's the dream that we're in. So do you have any examples of, of where maybe companies are, are, are using AI uh, and they're, they're being, uh, they're able to get growth or success by implementing some of these AI tools? Most of the use cases I'd say in 2023, you know, have been people using AI tools to increase their own productivity. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm really excited for is to be able to 10 years from now, look backwards and see uh, GDP growth spikes uh, yeah. when certain, like maybe GPT, you know, five you know, has released and all of a sudden there's a GDP spike. Probably we, we haven't been able to see that in 2023, 2024. It's hard to say how much of that though has been just because of the inertia of society just, and it's probably a good thing that like, it takes time for humans to adapt. So I think I think the, the story of how we're using even these same tools in the future is going to be very different from the stories we've had in the past. But so far, like I said, most of what I've been seeing from the from the day to day, you know, mom and pop sh stores out there have been individuals becoming a lot more productive with the tools. What I think is in the near term future, what more companies will be doing will be doing things like what we had just walked through of using AI as a member of your team to do specific tasks, but those tasks have to be things where the inputs and outputs are, are very, very clear, but then automating um, things that you couldn't automate before. And I think that's going to be, be very exciting as it's going to free up a lot of people, especially in the, um, in the beginning, just in the knowledge space to be you know, doing better work. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's exciting. It's an ex exciting time because all of these technologies are sort of converging at this point. So, you know, voice to text and, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, just, just, you know, you've got the video and, the, and, you know, the fact that we have, you know, the ability to do video chats uh, around the world and, and uh, all this stuff. Which, which is kind of interesting because it, it, it's sort of like COVID, for example, is a great example. Like COVID hit and hit an interesting time when the technology was available to do remote work. Otherwise, remote work would have never worked, right? And so yeah. the technology was there at a time when we needed it. And it seems like to me, there's a number of different technologies that are converging at the same time. So the speed at which we send audio uh, and video, you know, over the internet, you know, the the, the just like I said, the voice to text, the the language uh, translators, and all this sort of thing are all coming at the same time. So now you've got now the brains behind, uh, you know, some of the stuff. And as you say, we have to program it. We have to we have to make we have to design it. But the brains are now behind all of these other applications, and it's all kind of converging at one time. It's it's a really an exciting time to be alive. And I don't think ten years from now we will recognize. Uh, the world because i think it's going to shift that much in 10 years i mean do you feel the same way i think it's going to shift dramatically I, I the way i look at you know humans are still super fascinating in humans like when we yeah, yeah. basically made the best chess chess bot that could beat the best human player and we and you know, improved it even after that you know we didn't watch chess bots play chess bots like we 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 for some reason still like magnus carlson like we still like to watch chess players um and so I think a lot of things are going to be dramatically improved and a lot of disruption is going to be coming. But I think that humans are still just going to be a 
obsessed with 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 humans and i think that there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna stay the same which I, i'm sure you can appreciate as well but i i think that uh that we'll we'll stay we'll still be be living our lives and you know be not utopia not dystopia probably somewhere just down the middle i think you're right i think we're gonna really appreciate you know for example i've seen a lot of um like on social media you see a lot of people crafting like furniture and art and things that only re- kind of that are really unique to humans you know and i think i think those things will become kind of special you know like i like you know for example for 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 christmas uh my father made birdhouses for all the family and and it was like it was this handmade thing it was really cool the way he made them and everyone got one and so we all have one at our house and it's something that my my father made us all right i so i think those things the human things that you get or the human uh uh you know the 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 things that you see that are just pure that are not you know uh, you know ai driven or you know generated is are going to be like we're going to see and appreciate i would think and we'll we'll see the uniqueness of them i i i don't know i don't know if that makes sense but i do think that we will always be drawn to other humans i think what you know and i think that'll be kind of interesting to see those things will be elevated i think people who have the jobs like you know we talk about plumbers and welders and and painters and things that you know th- they are going to be elevated those jobs will be you know, more respected than maybe an accountant, for example, where a lot of accounting may get automated in the future. And so, you know, the guy that can actually weld pieces of metal and fix things, well, those are be more valuable, you know, going forward. So it's kind of interesting to see what will happen is, do we need a college degree, you know, and what is, what is higher education look like going forward? Right. Uh, uh, there's, you know, there's two threads there. I want to, I want to pull on just for a second. Sure, sure. A, I can, I completely agree. I think we need to do a big cultural reshuffling on on the dignity of a lot of blue collar jobs i think a lot honestly a lot of blue collar jobs are gonna be a hell of a lot harder to automate with ai and yeah. and a lot of people i think that i think we're starved for a lot of those of those people right now and so i think that we we definitely want to be elevating those um as as we just need a lot more of them <laughs> um, that's just the economics of it um the, the and the second thing that you were you were saying just how humans you know like the birdhouse like you were just it was it was a beautiful thing. I think people like myself and, and like my younger self, uh, very engineering mindset, very you know left brain, don't don't fully appreciate that. But the a huge moment there was a light bulb moment in my head is like if you watch the Teletubbies, the sun has a face on it, mm. and like as as babies. We we think of like parents as the world far before we see the world as an objective place. You know, we we see things as humanity's embedded inside of it. And so, you know, Jordan Peterson kind of talks about this. Like, you don't see a cliff; you see a falling off place. You don't see a a, a glass or ceramic; you see a a thing to drink from. You see things for more than just the physical matter, but instead what it's used for and the story of what's going to be used in the future and the story of where it's come from. And the way that I, I look at that is that if I listen to a song and that is like AI wrote this in the style of Taylor Swift and like it's a bop to it, sure, I might, I might listen to it, but unless something, unless I'm, I'm listening to be productive or I'm listening to it for some purpose – my brain can't connect, even if I'm hearing um, it emotionally, it's hitting the emotional notes. If I'm aware, and, and maybe there's just a part here, just like, if, if you are making AI, just like lie, just like say it's from Taylor Swift then. Um, but <laughs> then of course, the problem is um, people will know you're lying because it's fucking not Taylor Swift. And so, you know, what where do indie bands go is I think is a fantastic question. I, I kind of want to go down that detour now, but back to my core point. We are obsessed with humans. We connect with humans on a deeper level, and that's that's baked into us neurologically. And I think that's from the babies to the grownups. Um, and so I I think that that is a, a very engineering argument for uh, was probably going to be one of our saving graces. So that's that's how I see that. Yeah, I think you're right too. I think we're the, this uncanny valley. We can sense it, you know, and it's a weird thing. 
we just have this ability to sort of see fake or see but i don't know in the future i'm a, it'll be interesting because certainly some things i've seen and go wow that's really good <laughs> you know that's exceptional so yeah so that's it's gonna be well, good. even if it's exceptional i think we're still gonna be loving the artist like even when the, when the chess bot plays as well as a human we still want to watch the human play well we're gonna root for the human right aren't we i mean i feel like we will you know well at this point we just watch humans play other humans like like we just said yeah. okay cool the yeah. ai solved the problem and now we just can't put it to the side like now it's just more of a of a of a, of a triviality that's that's yeah. how i think a lot of things are going to go with art and with with human expression yeah interesting well what final message would you like to leave with our listeners today um just that We've gone through massive disruptions technologically before that if if you look at, at at history, while you know things are always a little bit different, things still come and go in, in rhythm. You know, Ray Dalio talks about that in, in, in his book. If if any of your listeners are interested in investment, um, that's fantastic his book of principles is a fantastic thing to check out. But you know, history comes and goes in cycles and I think that we're in a unique time in history, but we're not in quite of a spectacularly different, you know, extinction level uh, sort of situation as people might might think. And that uh, just focus on your unique value, focus on your family, focus on your community. And uh, I think there's a lot more evidence that we're we're heading to a a better place rather than a, a less good place on the technology front. I love it. That's, That's it. a great message, a great optimistic message from Garrick. And uh, I do agree with him. I do see this as a tool that's going to get us better, just like the internet did, just like ATMs did. Uh, it's going to make us uh, be able to do more and uh, be able to achieve things that we never thought possible. So it'll be an exciting time for sure. And uh, I'm glad I'm here and alive to see it because it's uh, it's the, the amount of things I'm, I'm of the age. Of, I didn't grow up with the internet. And so now I'm seeing AI. And I'm like, wow, this is just wild. So it's kind of a cool time to be alive. Uh, so again, business leaders, as you're listening in, um, think about this, think about AI, think about your, you know, processes that that, that are time consuming, and, and there are your bottlenecks, and how can you automate that, make it better? So how can you do more uh, with AI? So Garrick, this has been great. How can listeners find out more about you and your company? Yeah, thanks, John, for having me. This was a lot of fun. Uh, for your audience, I would just say if you're looking for a partner to increase your business valuation or just need help building a, a software application uh, that that uses AI, then you can uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn or uh, for more information about how we uh, build software teams, you can check out my website, Valhalla.team. And that's it for, for now. I have a few other projects in the works, but uh, I'll announce those on, on on LinkedIn or other platforms later so you can follow me for updates on that. Very good. We're going to put links to show notes uh, in the show notes for all of Garrick's resources. And again, if AI is something you're curious about, if we we uh, we only just wet your appetite and you've got deeper questions, I'm not the guy to talk to. Garrick is the guy to talk to. That's why we're going to put his contacts in uh, here in the show notes. Reach out to Garrick and uh, ask him some questions. And especially if you got a company and you want to automate some of those uh, difficult tasks using AI, Garrick's the guy to do that and reach out to him and find out more. And see if we can help you uh, basically harness this new power of AI to, to be more effective in your organization. Garrick, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing this interesting topic. Uh, I love it. It's fun. I'm an old guy trying to figure it out, but I think it's a really exciting time. So thank you for bringing your expertise on to Deep Leadership. Thank you, John, for having me. This was fun. Thank you again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.